Hi, this is the Tropical Tidbit for Monday evening, August 17th. As always, the thoughts here are mine alone, and in making decisions, consult the National Hurricane Center and your local weather office for the best information. Well, here's the big satellite picture of the full Atlantic, and we have a couple of areas of disturbed weather that we're watching now, getting deeper into the peak of the season, uh, when this starts to become more common, latter half of August is when things typically really start picking up during the hurricane season. This year is proving no exception, and we may have a few storms to deal with over the coming weeks and potentially beyond as the peak of the season lasts through mid-October. So we'll have lots of activity from now going forward most weeks. Um, looking at the big satellite picture here, this hurricane over west of Mexico is Genevieve in the eastern Pacific. Uh, but as far as the Atlantic goes, we're watching two disturbances, one moving across the Windward Islands, uh, currently called 97L, and then a new one uh, over in the Central Atlantic, closer to Africa, named 98L. Neither of these are storms just yet, but both could become storms over the coming days. We're going to start with 97L first. This is a tropical wave that is moving westward into the Caribbean, and if we take a closer look at a, a zoomed-in satellite picture, uh, we'll see a clump of cloudiness and thunderstorms here, mostly confined to Martinique southward, but these islands are getting gusty winds and rainfall as this wave passes through tonight, um, but overall not really a big deal. If you look really closely at the low-level flow, we'll have uh, these northeasterly trade winds on the northwest side of the wave, but if you really look in here, you'll see southerly wind in the low to mid levels uh, in the vicinity of uh, Barbados and Tobago, and this is indicating a nice sharply kinked wave axis right here where the flow is doing this. And this wave axis will continue to propagate westward uh, through the Caribbean and it will have decent chances of development. Now, we typically think of waves entering the Caribbean as entering a more hostile environment because typically you have very strong trade winds in the middle of the Caribbean that speed up, and that typically makes it very hard for these waves to generate closed circulations. And we talked about that with Tropical Storm Gonzalo and Tropical Storm Isaias earlier this season, um, but that is not going to be true for this particular wave, as right now you can see the trade winds here, these clouds moving slowly right to left, are moving, as I said, slowly. It's not very strong trade winds here. Uh, this is not July, and so this is a much more favorable environment in the Caribbean than you would typically see. In addition, the water vapor satellite picture here shows us how the upper level flow is moving, and we have this beautiful uh, anticyclonic signature in the flow, clockwise elliptical high here centered over the Caribbean, and this is an ideal situation in terms of wind shear for the wave. So this is not your typical hostile eastern and central Caribbean that we're used to seeing um, in July and in many years. Um, but as far as its development chances, they're not uh, they're not amazingly high simply because uh, there's some dry air in the vicinity uh, that the wave is dealing with. And we can tell this for a couple of reasons. One is that there's a very sharp boundary right here, north of which is very, very dry air that is going to continue to impact the wave envelope as it comes through the Caribbean. And secondly, we can tell that this convection is behaving in a rather pulsy or blobby manner. In other words, many thunderstorms are growing upward and then collapsing again and being replaced by new ones. This pulsing convective pattern typically means that there's at least some kind of dry air or um, less than ideal thermodynamic structure to the atmosphere within the wave envelope. And uh, so we can tell that this has some work to do if it's going to optimize its environment going forward. But it has a chance, and uh, once it gets farther west in the Caribbean, uh, that could still happen. Uh, for one, of the, one thing that is going to aid it going forward is that we have a strong wave signature over Venezuela as well. If you look down here, you'll see a kink in the low-level flow. Southerlies over eastern Venezuela, east-northeast flow in northern Venezuela. And this wave is going to be moving up into the western Caribbean at the same time that this wave envelope is joining it. And by the time it gets to uh, west of Jamaica, for example, our wave will come here, and then our Venezuelan perturbation will also come here, and we might have a, a nicer region of background spin of vorticity uh, by the time this gets to about Jamaica's longitude. So by the time it gets here and farther west, we may see better chances for development. And we do see some models that suggest that that could happen. This is the GFS 850 millibar uh, flow 
forecast for Thursday morning, so three days from this morning's 12Z run. This is our wave came from where it is now to this location, and uh, we can see some nice background spin to the flow here, but no closed circulation just yet by this point. But as you go forward on the model, we see this propagate and start to form more of a, a closed low in a circulation here, and we do get a storm out of this in the Western Caribbean on this particular model run by Friday or Saturday. Um, by comparison, the European model does not really have anything here, and it, it keeps this an open wave, perhaps for some of the dry air reasons that we talked about. And if this does form long term, we're talking about a five day forecast here, so we're already getting out there in terms of uh, lead time, it's getting kind of uncertain after five days, but we do know that there's going to be a big upper level trough here if we look at the 200 millibar forecast on the GFS, and this big trough is digging into the Gulf of Mexico, likely to cause some kind of southwesterly shear over any developing storm that does try to form in the Western Caribbean. So if it tries to sneak up into the Gulf, for instance, how it interacts with that trough and that shear, uh, you know, some limiting factors uh, potentially in its path, um, but it could also be a, a legitimate storm that moves into the Gulf or moves across the Yucatan Peninsula. Lots of uh, questions about what would happen by the time it gets to this point, but the point being for now, watch in the Western Caribbean. This is something for Central America from Nicaragua to the Yucatan Peninsula to Western Cuba to keep an eye on during this week. As by the weekend comes along, we may be looking at a storm generally in that region. Probably about a 50-50 chance right now of that occurring. So we'll keep an eye on that. All right, so that's 97L uh, moving into the Caribbean. We're now going to talk about 98L farther to its east. This is the one coming behind. This will also be coming westward over the coming days, and this one is uh, more complicated at the moment. Here's the zoomed in shot. The sun has already gone down at the end of this loop. Um, the central feature that you'll see here is this clump of thunderstorms in the middle of the loop, and this is indeed where the primary disturbance likely is, but this is, this is one of those things that remains embedded in the monsoon trough, and by monsoon trough, I mean the winds that generally are doing this to the south and curving up out of the west-southwest, and then you have the trade winds to the north coming out of the northeast like this, and this happens over this whole zone. So this entire this entire belt here has this rotation to it where you've got westerlies to the south, easterlies to the north, and this forms what we call the monsoon trough. This, this disturbance is a kink within that large-scale trough, and uh, this can be difficult um, to predict when they are still embedded in this large zone because uh, these can easily roll up into little circulations and exactly where that happens and how strong those circulations are um, is hard to predict because the flow goes to about zero along this line and so how fast they move and where they form can be difficult for computer models to predict and in this particular situation this is this is a total mess uh, we have this clump of thunderstorms and some kind of rotation at the low to mid levels sitting in here but we also have a low level circulation sitting in there um, today but without much thunderstorm activity and then we have another wave to the east in here which is mostly defined at the mid levels and you can see that the low level flow in this location is out of the west southwest because the monsoon trough boundary is up in here to the north of this wave which means that there's no well-defined low level circulation with that blob over there in addition we have a screaming African easterly jet coming from right to left, which you can see some of these cloud elements coming from right to left very quickly on your screen. That's a big mid-level jet coming to the north of all of this, which also complicates matters when these waves are trying to develop within the monsoon trough. So I'm throwing that all at you to let you know that there's a lot of pieces to a puzzle like this, and this is one of those situations where 98L is something we're going to have to wait and see when it develops and where it develops to have a better idea of its future. There are going to be a lot of questions until that happens because this is quite simply put a mess. But we can look at some of the model forecasts and try to decipher what could happen. And if we look at the GFS to start out, this is the 700 millibar flow, and this is 98L right here. That's that area of thunderstorms in the center of your satellite loop. So that's here, and again, it's it's within this uh, broad zone of yellows and oranges that you can see here that we call the monsoon trough, and you can see the very strong wind barbs, strong easterly flow to the north of it. That's the African easterly jet. This is associated with a bubble of Saharan air, which is very dry up here to the north, and this will be pushing westward along with 98L as it tracks westward over the coming days. 
you can see to the east we have our other wave uh, and that's going to catch up with it over the next day or two so if we go forward here you're going to see here's 98 here's this other thing behind it now the consensus seems to be that this is going to catch up with it because the strong jet to the north is kind of pushing this one over and these end up kind of joining together as we go forward and by Wednesday you can see on the model the one to the east has kind of faded out and our main one um, that's currently being called 98L develops a closed circulation here and on this particular model run becomes a storm on Wednesday in the central Atlantic and then continues eastward at, or westward as a storm and then we're dealing with a tropical storm east of the Leeward Islands on Friday. Now you can see this is this has been changing over time. If you go to the prior run valid at the same time, we had an open wave instead of a storm, and the run before that even weaker. So we've had a trend toward more development on uh, the most recent GFS runs. We also see this on the European model, where 98 is here to start the model run. And uh, as we go forward, we have a storm rather quickly also on this model on Wednesday, so within two days, and then that tracks farther north than on the GFS and passes north of the Leeward Islands um, on Friday and Saturday. And at this point, this is where models really, really diverge uh, because we have a few things going on. Um, one is the intensity of the storm because a stronger storm in this case will tend to move farther north and there are going to be a couple of obstacles potentially in this storm's way. One is this very strong um, sow bubble to the north. You can see this area of high pressure uh, just to the north of the storm. This is that a bubble of Saharan air layer, very dry, warm air directly to the north of this developing storm and thus causing a very strong easterly jet between that high and uh, the low that is the storm. And this strong easterly jet could cause some mid-level wind shear to occur when the storm is east of the Leeward Islands. But exactly how much shear depends on what latitude the storm is at. If the storm is farther north, closer to this mid-level jet, stronger shear. But if it's farther south, farther away from the jet, less shear. And that can be very sensitive, exactly how far north it is. And we don't really know because, again, we're launching this thing out of a rather uncertain area. Again, this is an absolute mess to start things off. So how this consolidates all this yellow and orange here over the coming two days will determine precisely where the storm is when we get to Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. There's still uncertainty in that. And we see the GFS and Euro actually do disagree here, with the GFS taking this across the Leeward Islands and toward the Greater Antilles, Puerto Rico, Hispaniola, uh, following to the south of the Saharan air layer ridge to the north. Whereas the European model has a stronger storm that does struggle with the shear and weakens a bit, but is farther north, such that it is able to continue north of the Greater Antilles and re-strengthen as it enters the Bahamas on Sunday and Monday as we head into next week. So there is, of course, several days in advance, uncertainty in how this will evolve. Uh, there's a couple of different outcomes that could occur here, but in general, this is expected to approach the Lesser Antilles within the next four days or so. And by the time we get to this weekend, we expect potential impacts uh, from some kind of strong tropical wave or storm, at this point most likely a storm, in the Leeward Islands and Greater Antilles. And so the typical flood threats at a minimum are likely to be something to keep an eye on here for the heavy rain that will be associated with this. As far as any other specific impacts other than that, we're not going to know yet. We don't have a storm. We need a well-defined circulation that has left the monsoon trough before we can track it more precisely. We do know that this is um, very likely to be some sort of problem down the road because we have a very strong mid-level ridge to the north of this for the next several days at least. This is the Euro for Friday morning showing the basic steering pattern where we have a, an elliptical ridge across the middle Atlantic and our storm is here on the model. And even if it goes north of the Leeward Islands initially, it's likely to continue westward for quite some time before trying to turn around this ridge. So even points farther west could potentially have to watch this even if it uh, misses the Lesser Antilles initially. So this will be something to start keeping on your radar if you're living in the Greater Antilles and the Bahamas as uh, this could be affecting uh, you folks within the next 
five to six days and uh, that'll come up quickly so be ready just in case uh, as far as any potential downstream impacts to the United States really too early uh, to talk too much about that yes this ridge does extend quite far to the west and it could potentially be on the United States radar as well uh, but there's just too many questions right now as to how strong this will be and where it is um, by the time we get toward the weekend at that point we'll know a lot more similar to when Isaias was approaching we got to wait until it gets to that point before we can answer those kinds of questions but it's the peak of the hurricane season you should have a plan ready to go just in case something comes your way as things can happen quickly in the tropics and within several days time we could have not one but two storms threatening land at the same time so keep an eye on things that's it for now thanks for watching